One of the greatest business questions I have ever been asked was at a Thrive event. Previous event, I was talking about success, millions of pounds, you know, great house, lifestyle, success, success, success. And there was a guy at the back and he put up his hand at the very end of the event and goes, yeah, yeah, that's great, but is there a but? And that one question inspired me to talk about the hardships, the dark side, the struggles of business. So if, if, if you look at a lot of my content, probably about 80% of it is depressing. I'm talking about this, the struggles, <laughs> the hardship. It, it's not the check me in the Lambo or the Rolls Royce in front of a fancy house. It's not that, it, it's like the real struggles. So I'm hoping for some similar, you know, fascinating questions. One of the biggest red flags for me when I do recruitment is if the candidate has worked four places or more in the past three years, that is an automatic no. And the reason for that is for me, if someone comes on my team, we invest a lot of time, energy, money, upskilling them. And the last thing we want is a job hopper, someone who's just going to come into this job, use it as a stepping stone and then move on. One thing I really admire in a CV, people who have worked in one place for a good number of years. So I've got a girl coming in, in the past seven years, she's only worked for that one company. And for me, that's a massive, massive green light. And that's why she's getting the interview. Let's see how it goes. Other hardships, the ones that no one talk about, the constant criticism you get. Whatever you do, people have got an opinion. And you've got to be very careful when you start out in business because you are not an expert, but you will be bombarded with other people's negativity and criticism. And that is enough to derail you if you're not mentally resolute in your goals. This piece of paper is worth how much? £139. This is my baby boy. He's just turned 14. He's taller than me. No longer treated like a baby. He is going to be thrown in at the deep end of business and I'm going to teach him as much as I can. So today's three lessons. Number one, get organised. This piece of paper is worth £139. That's a VAT that I paid for the van repair. Then has to be filed away safely and then given to the accountant so we can claim back the VAT. So get organised and get your paperwork sorted. Next thing. What was the next lesson, Dean? Make it easy for people to pay. Make it easy for people to pay. Here is a laminated piece of paper with my sort code and account number. Whenever we're selling franchises, we just take this out of the drawer and say, there's the details there, you can transfer the money. Every single person in the office has got one of these. So we make it as easy as possible for people to pay Boss Pizza money. And it's my job to help facilitate that. Lesson number three was? Dress smart. Dress smart. You never know who's going to walk into the office or who you're going to meet and you've always got to play your A game and look razor sharp at all times. Thank you very much. How was your first day in the office? Brilliant. And how much are you getting paid per hour? Three pound. Three pound an hour. And do you think, is that not like so much money? It's like above average. It's above average. There you have it. Three pound an hour is above average. Well done, Dean. Thanks very much. I'm here with my 14 year old son. He's learning all about business and every day I teach him three random business lessons. Okay, Dean, what was lesson number one from today? Say no quickly. Exactly. In life, you're going to be bombarded with so many sales calls, options, people saying, can we do this for you? Can we do that for you? Never say, mm, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. You waste your own time and their time. Straight into lesson number two, down at the Boss Pizza Shop, who pays the wages? You do. Really? No, the customer does. Exactly. Well done. In any business, you need to drum into your team. It is not it's not the boss that comes in with a fancy suit and dishes out the cash. It's not the case. It's the customers that pay the wages for any business. And one of the best quotes ever is by Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. He said, the customer can fire everyone in your business from the chairman on down just by spending his money somewhere else. So the customer pays the wages. So get that into your head. That's why we need to have great customer service. Okay, lesson number three. Video editing is a key skill. Go. Yes, video editing. So Dean is learning um, video editing just now. And for every business owner and every youngster, they should know video editing. Short form content is now massive. So if you've got the ability to film TikToks or, you know, shorts or Instagram reels, that could be phenomenal for your business at relatively low cost. Back in the day when I was like starting out in business, if I had to get a video editor in, it would cost about £500 a day. And that price has just come down, 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 down to the point where it's free. And now my son's doing it for me. Excellent. Thank you very much. And you're still on £3 an hour? Yep. How, how do you find that? All right. <laughs> it's all right. He thinks yesterday when he started uh, on day one, he thought that was above average. So uh, we'll, just we'll, we'll just go with that just now. Okay. Thanks very much, Dean. I'll see you tomorrow. Day four of having my son in the office. I'm teaching him all about business. Dean, you're on £3 an hour. How do you feel? Great.
Great, three pounds is so much money for a 14 year old. How long would it take to post 50 bits of content on social media if you were to do it? An hour. An hour, it would take us about 10 to 15 minutes. Let me show you how. So today's post is we're looking for a shop in Luton, right? So that's the post. Here's the blurb. This is a key thing. Every single social media channel is actually on this spreadsheet and it's hyperlinked. So this is how long it takes to post. Right, so say for example, I'm on LinkedIn. Just click the hyperlink, copy that, post, boss pizza Luton, post. Done. Right. Next thing, we go back to the spreadsheet, click, click it, click in the next one. 25 seconds we've posted in three different accounts. So that's how quickly it is. We're not looking at minutes or hours, it's about seconds. It should take you no more than 15 seconds to post in approximately 50 different channels. For your own channels, get yourself a spreadsheet set up with hyperlink and it takes you seconds. It's copy and paste and you rattle out. So if you've got a business out there and you've got multiple different channels, you've got stories, Instagram, LinkedIn, X, whatever it is you've got, get it all in a spreadsheet, get it hyperlinked, linked create your blurb on a second screen and then it's just a case of copying and pasting it get 50 bits of content out for your business every single day go do that for your business and you'll see amazing results good luck in three years i've managed to open up four shops and you might think that's poor that is actually excellent and i'll tell you why because see if you were to come to my office if you were to open up the hatch and look at the foundation that foundation that i've spent the last three years building can support a 300 story skyscraper. I'm in no rush to build a big business. I'm doing it right, so I'm focusing on the foundation and I've just been busy building the foundation for the past three years. You're not gonna hear a boss pizza and then bang, we're everywhere. So that, 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 that's the way that we're going, to, we're going to expand this business. Not a single subject I was taught at university is relevant in today's business world. Five years of business subjects, I'm not using a single thing I learned at university in running my business. Yeah. That tells you something. It does. Uh, no, I think university is very good. You want to be a doctor? Right. Yeah, that's great. You learn medicine and you study medicine, you become a doctor. Um, you study dentistry, you become a dentist. But for business, it's a grey area. Imagine learning from a lecturer who has never run a business. W what are they going to teach you about business? Yeah. Would you rather learn from a lecturer who has never had the experience of running their own business? Or would you rather learn from a multimillionaire who's been through and had the battle scars and faced the hardships? Here's 10 ways in how we made it really busy at lunchtime. Number one, we gave away hundreds of free lunches to school kids to create the buzz and let people know that we're open for lunch. Two, we've got a compelling offer. We've got four lunch deals for under five pound. We're giving people reason to come into the shop. Number three, promotional posters outside the store. Number four, we've handed out leaflets. We march up and down the streets, handing out free leaflets from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock every morning. We're giving away free branded pens with every order. We're doing Facebook ads, TikTok competitions, and in-store giveaways as well. So if you want to make your business busy, you've got to run multiple things. The big mistake a lot of business owners make is they open up a business, they expect the customers to come running. That doesn't happen. You've got to have a targeted campaign using multiple different channels. In our case, we used 10 different channels and that's how we made our business busy. Thank you. Cold calling is one of the biggest blights in the business landscape in the UK. So it's not regulated. If it is regulated, it's not working because the phone calls are coming from overseas. I'll tell you, when I had the restaurant business, we would get six, seven, eight, nine, ten sales calls every single day from the minute we opened within the first hour. And it just got to the point, even if you were selling me a solid gold bar for one pence, I would be like, no thanks, I'm not interested because we were that fed up with the number of cold calls that came in, which is a shame because there will be some genuine sort of good offers mixed in amongst that. But the default answer for cold calls is pff, no thanks. So um, I've got quite a dim view on the cold calls and that's just as a result of the sheer volume of spam calls that we have um, had over the past few years. And would you go residential or commercial if you were starting from scratch with nothing? Commercial all day long. Commercial Why? property is so easy and there is so little regulation. So for 
residential, you've got PAT testing, the gas safety certificates, you've got the LEDs tests, uh, le Legionella yeah. tests, and then and then once the tenants are in, there's so much regulation that protects the tenants, which is good as well. But there's so many rent deposit scheme, there's so many rules and regulations, and that's why all of my residential properties are let out through agents because I just don't have the time to deal with all that nonsense. Commercial is really easy. I've had properties where the date of entry comes, I get the key. I hand it to the agent, he advertises it, and I don't have to spend a penny. I don't have to spend a minute's worth of effort improving the place or getting it done up. You know, I have to spend no time, no effort on that. Get an FRI lease on that and... Yeah, it's full repairing and insuring lease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that basically what that means is, for the viewers who don't know, the tenant is responsible for everything. If there's a leaky roof, the commercial tenant is responsible. The lights go out, it's the, it's the tenant's responsibility, whereas it's totally the opposite mm -hmm. in residential. So I love commercial because it's so easy. Yes, I'm a commercial property expert. I have got a lot of commercial property. Commercial property is so much easier than residential property. In residential property, the landlord is responsible for everything from changing the light bulbs to maintenance, to fixing the boilers, to electric testing, gas testing, you name it. In commercial property, I once bought a property, an industrial unit, got the key, gave it to the agent, he advertised it and he got it rented out. I didn't have to spend a minute nor a penny of effort on that property and that's been generating me a good income for the last eight, nine years. So commercial property is a lot better than residential property, but be warned, if you do have a commercial property and it sits empty for some amount of time, you could be liable for business rates and that could be a killer. We're in Turkey. This is the last day of our holiday. We have been well and truly baked in the oven. So today's business lesson from my 14 year old son is all about... Consistency. Consistency. So we've been to this resort how many times? Six times. And why do you think we keep, com keep coming back to this resort over and over again? Because they're consistent. Consistent and we know exactly what to expect. We, we expect this standard, it always meets that standard and that's great. So when you're running a business, it's very easy to get off to a really hot start and a really great start. But after six months, after the initial enthusiasm has died down, you've got to make sure that the consistency remains in place forever. That's what brings back repeat custom. And if you've got a business where you've got a repeat custom, that's how you win. So consistency is king. King, yes, exactly. Consistency is king. We were complaining about the weather in Scotland. I can't wait to get back to Scotland. I can't wait to stand in the rain. If we're lucky to get that. If we're lucky to get that. Even 10 degree heat would be amazing. I want to try and create a dream social media setup. I want to churn out lots of great business content set up where I can do my business seminars. We're going to have a podcast corner. We're going to have a straight to camera piece over there. We're going to have a, another business Q&A session. So the idea is bring all of the content creation into one neat space you don't have to do traveling all over the country and different podcasts It'll all be managed locally here and that's just going to allow us to create much more great business content the cost of this pizza is 10 pounds how much clear profit is there in this pizza probably maybe 20 or 30 percent no idea four pound i have no clue take a guess how much of it goes straight into my pocket clear profit six pound a fiver fiver aye it's 64 pence 64 pence Profit? That's it. No, That's it's it. no. Aye, it is. Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely sure. <laughs> no. You're kidding me. Oh my God. Let's find out how much of this pizza is clear profit. 20% of EAT, that's two pounds straight away to the VAT man. 24% wage cost. 17% is food cost. That's cheese, dough, sauce, packing, overhead. 18% business rate, rent, gas, electric, water, bins, phone, internet, all of those overheads. 13% commission to just eat and 8% profit. And this is what happens with a profit. Government deduct 20% corporation tax, leaving you with 64 pence. That is your profit and that is all of your expenses. At Dark Kitchens, I'm an expert in dark kitchens because I had a dark kitchen, right? If you are interested in opening a food brand in a dark kitchen, a new food brand in a dark kitchen, understand this. The setup cost is minuscule. The setup cost is tiny. But the marketing cost is going to be so much more because nobody knows where you are. So whatever you save in the setup cost, you're going to have to spend extra money on um, marketing and brand awareness. 
So Boss Pizza started as a dark kitchen concept. So Boss Pizza started as a dark kitchen concept. And people were in Hamilton were like, where is this? I've been on Almada Street and I can't see it anywhere. They were like, is this coming from someone's house? Um, is this even legal? It was all these sort of questions and comments we were getting. So um, whatever you save in dark kitchens and setup costs, you'll have to spend extra money raising brand awareness. We're in Scotland. This is freak weather. It's never like this, is it? No. It's always 30 degrees plus. Anyway, the sign above us is? For sale. For sale. Well, business too late. No, it's too late. Office too late. And the sign above us is? Too late. Office too late. Come on, let's get in. Let's get in out this rain and we'll talk about that. We're in out the rain. What did we see outside? A too late sign. The too late sign. Boss Pizza is expanding fast. We've outgrown our current headquarters here and we're moving into a much bigger premises where we can recruit a much bigger team and sort of really accelerate the growth of the business. And the key lesson here, Dean, is you have got to make decisions fast. You have got to be as decisive as possible within the space of three, four weeks. We've decided that we need a new office. We've viewed a number of offices. We've done the deal. We're going to get the keys and we're going to move in and start recruiting straight away. So you need to be as as decisive as possible. Be decisive. One thing that no one has ever spoken about. There you go, mate. There's 40 quid. What's your name? Scott. <laughs> I have never in my business life heard anyone talk about the definition of value. If you give me 10 pounds, I'll give you 20 pounds. That's great. Would you like to do that again? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Give me 10 pounds, I'll give you 20 pounds. That's great. Again? Okay, yep. Yeah. You could do that all day long, right? Every one of you will be here wanting to do business with me. Let me tell you about the thinking behind the scenes. If we're selling £20 worth of stuff, we would cram £40 worth of value. The service would be fast, the place would be slick, the phone operators are professionally trained, the food is really good quality, the portions are really big. If you had to get that £20 takeaway somewhere else, it would be £40. So whatever you're doing in your business, start thinking about the value that you're adding to your customers. And if you're adding double what you're charging, if I'm charging £10, I'm trying to deliver twice the value for that. In my property portfolio is mixed, it's both commercial and residential. I fell into it by accident when I was age 20. I was living with my parents. At that point, I'd left school. I'd worked full time for four years, managed to save up about five thousand pounds. It was enough to put a deposit down on a house. Got the house and moved into it, and decided I don't like it. Moved back in with my parents, and I rented out the house. And I thought that's when the penny dropped. I thought, wait a minute, someone else is just going to pay the mortgage, and I'm going to get a house out of this. So that's that's where it started. From there, just every couple of years, again. Don't be in a rush. Every couple of years, saved up enough money to buy a, a flat and then saved up some more money to buy a flat. And in those days, a flat would be about 50, 60,000. You would need five, 10% deposit. So what you, year would that have been roughly? Late 90s, yeah. yeah. This is where a lot of people get it wrong. They think they're, they're buying an expensive flat. No, all you have to worry about is just can you save up enough money to afford the deposit? That's it, the 5%. So if a flat's 60,000, all you need is 3,000 pounds. And you ask any young working person, can you save up £1,000 at a push? And they'll probably say, you know what, if we really tried, we probably could, right? Do that three times, and then you've got enough to buy a flat. Here in Turkey, last day of the holiday, I'm teaching my son about business, 14 years old. What's the best way of making money? What's dad taught you? Don't be a sellout. Don't be a sellout, don't chase the money. In my first business, the way I became incredibly successful was by not chasing the money. I just focused on the best service, the best product, the best offering for the customer. And that's what won the day. I didn't ever make business decisions based on how much money I'm going to make. I never even thought about the money. And as a result of offering that great service, great product, great offering consistently, day in, day out for years, I ended up winning the day because customers really like that. Business decisions on what's best for the customer, not what's best for you. Who here is on TikTok? Being on TikTok is not uh, an option, it's a must. And the way you be successful on TikTok is you should never sell your service on TikTok. Make it about your audience. This talk is about you. I started off by saying 30 seconds about me, the rest of the time is about you. That's exactly what you do on TikTok. That's how you win. Over a period of weeks, months, you could actually have a phenomenal following. And you sell by not selling. That's the key thing on TikTok. We're getting 30 franchise inquiries per week. That's the power of TikTok. Establish credibility. Get on TikTok, my friends. This is my 14-year-old son. I'm I'm teaching him everything about business and today, Dean, what am I going to teach you? 
a double wins or not. If you're in business, you need to be looking sharp, especially when wearing a tie. And this is the ultimate knot, in my opinion. Let's go. Okay, so you've got the two flaps there. The thin side bring underneath and you want about 10 centimeters. Now hold it with a sand here. Good. Now this flap here, bring it behind, through and down to the right and pull on it really hard. Now what to do is just keep hold of this, the smaller side here, bring it round the back. Good. And then up through, up through here, and then down again, and pull down on it really hard. You want that knot to be as tight and firm as possible. That's a hard part. Now the next part of this is, we're gonna bring this round the front. That's it, round the front like that, and then up, and then through down here. And then see this bit, you don't pull hard, you just gently caress it into the shape. There you go. And there you have the perfect double Windsor. Okay. <laughs> Put everything into that business. The stakes were so high, you have to make it a success. And that's why we didn't take holidays, we didn't take any breaks, we didn't treat ourselves to nice cars or anything like that. It was just pure work for six years. And now, my God, what a transformation in our lifestyle. So this is how I expanded my small business to being the biggest takeaway operation in Britain. So I owned Mushtax, which I grew it to being the biggest takeaway operation in Britain. Here's my formula. I spent 50% of my time promoting the business. There is no point doing a good job if no one knows about it. I spent 50% of my time promoting the business. I spent 7% of sales on marketing um, and we had 30 different marketing channels. We were relentless when it came to promoting the business. We would do 3,000 leaflets a week. We would do uh, 5,000 text messages a week. We had 20,000 people on, on the database. We would do um, billboard, billboard adverts, radio adverts, text messaging, WhatsApp, social media. We did 30 different marketing channels and that's how I grew my business. Um, so if you're serious about growth, understand you need to get good at marketing and you need to spend money on marketing. My dad used to earn £200 a week salary and of that he used to spend £60 on private tuition for my brothers and sisters. Wow. That's a sacrifice. My brother's a doctor, my sister's a doctor. My other sister's a scientist and I was a lawyer. I think my parents, like many immigrant parents, they came to this country with very little money. They didn't know the language. They didn't have any savings. They didn't know the culture. Dad had the foresight of thinking, if you really get the kids educated, it could be life-changing for them. So that's why he put so much emphasis on education for us when we were younger. All immigrant families had to make similar sacrifices like that. My my favourite book of all time would be a book called Brand Failures by Matt Haig. In life, in entrepreneurship, you don't have time to make all the mistakes. It's an older book, but the business lessons are still the same. It's an insight to some of the biggest companies in the world and the big mistakes they've made. And that is one of my favourite books of all time. First things first, I sell pizza. There is me up there. I've got some people and I've got some customers. What on earth have we got in common? And the answer is everything. Every single business in the world runs on exactly the same principles. And the big mistake a lot of people make, they think, oh, they're an accountant. No, they're not a businessman. I'm a lawyer. No, I don't need to know about business. Every single business has all of these elements. And the fact that I sell pizza or you sell accountancy service or you sell insurance, is not even the tip of the iceberg. We've got everything in common. Everyone in this room has got everything in common. And it wasn't my intention to get back into property, but the next door property came up for sale. I thought, you know what, that's quite handy, I'll buy that. Residential or commercial? Commercial. commercial. And then the next door property came up. Oh, that's quite handy, I'll buy that. And then the next door one came up and that's got like 40 car parking spaces. You know what, that, that, that'll come in handy, I'll buy that. Just by me being there on Almada Street, I ended up buying like 10 properties within a one acre site all joined together. And the land to marriage value of that is insane. It's like worth, worth so much money. Whereas the individual properties are maybe worth like 400,000, 200,000, yeah, but the land marriage value of having all of that in Almada Street is just phenomenal. How many times a day are you posting? One, okay. Gentleman here, blue shirt, how many times a day are you posting? 0.1. 0 0.1, 0 okay, good. So you should be posting 50 times per day. And I'm going to show you how we post 50 times a day. How long do you think it would take to post 50 bits of content a day? One hour, all day, fair enough. Okay, 15 minutes it takes us. And this is how we do it. This was yesterday's post. Wrote that on the whiteboard. Took a picture of it. Wrote the blurb. 
and then over here, every single platform is on the spreadsheet. On the spreadsheet is a link to that social media. So that's a link to my LinkedIn page, for example. Clicking that, pops up, copy, paste, add that image in, takes about 10 seconds, bang, done. You need to get posting like many times a day. If you can't do 50, do five. And you might think, well, that doesn't make much difference. And you're all probably thinking that, right? But it's like going to the gym. I go to the gym once, I'm not gonna come back with like ripped muscles. If you go consistently day in, day out, over a period of two, three months, you start to see the difference. That's where you win. Talk about value, doubling the value. As a small business, how do you work that out? Like you're kind of working, not for the budget to start with. One of the ways that I grew uh, my businesses to being the success you know, they achieved is by not being greedy. I kept the profit margins around about seven, eight percent net, and the rest of the money I put back into marketing the business or put back into delivering value for the customers. And I think where a lot of businesses get it wrong is their profit margins are too chunky. That's great for you, but see your customer on the other end of the table, they're gonna think, is that all right or is that good? Keep the profit margins low-ish and reasonable and don't get too greedy. That's a strategy that's worked for me. Great point. If I had to spend a day in the life off, that would be, it would be Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos has improved the quality of my life 100 fold. It's just everything's just done on the phone and the amount of time that that man has saved me is unreal. I had to buy a watering can. So I went, you know, a big B&Q and I'm walking up and down that aisles looking for watering cans. It just felt primitive. And I'm thinking I should have just got it off Amazon. He's completely transformed the way that we shop and the way that we save time. And I can't say that about Mark Zuckerberg or Richard Branson or Elon Musk, but the work that Jeff Bezos has done allowed me to save so much time, which I can spend with my family. How do you keep good people? Oh, that's easy. You pay them well, you give them challenging work, you give them career progression, and the combination of all of this I found for me worked really well. And I learned that in London. When I started with Accenture, which is a global management consultancy, my salary was 40% above the market rate. It was 28 and a half thousand pounds starting salary with a 10,000 pound golden handshake straight out of uni way back then. My law graduate friends were earning 14,000. And you know what that extra money did? I would sit at my desk and I would focus on the work. I would put 100% and I knew I wasn't gonna get that money anywhere else out there in the market. Had they paid me 14,000 pounds, I would be there working and looking around for, that, uh, for other jobs that paid better. Mm -hmm. If you pay so much more, it helps your team just maintain that focus because they just know, you know, they're not gonna get the same salary anywhere else. For any business starting out, don't compete with your little local rival. It's okay to go and compete with the big guns. That just gives your brand much more credibility, attention. So we are after the Domino's market. Our pizzas are 40% bigger, our price is 50% cheaper and our dough is made fresh in store every single day. So we're bigger, better, fresher than Domino's and I'm not interested in competing with the local pizza shops. Let's go after the multi-billion pound pizza market there that's dominated by Domino's. You have got to go through the shit for five to ten years of your life and then the other side of that mountain of shit is success. And the majority of the people in this room are not willing to make the sacrifices to get to the other side of the mountain. No one is mentioning this. You must have money in the bank because even having money in the bank gives you options if it just sits there and sits there. I've had money sitting in the bank sometimes for years and you hear all of these gurus saying oh, it's losing its value. It should be invested in something else. My opinion, it should sit in the bank. I'm all right then, I'm all good. <laughs> yeah. I get absolutely <laughs> slated yeah. the same time that I bought one property, he's bought about hundreds, do you right. know what I mean? So I owned 10 properties in one block in Hamilton, right? There was one property I didn't own and if someone else bought that, that would have been a thorn in my side forever, right? And I just said to the guy, this was many years ago, 15 years ago or something, shop was worth about 40, 50,000 pounds. I said to the guy, I'll pay 80,000 pounds. I want the date of entry to, to be tomorrow. And he agreed and I got the keys the very, the very next day. I was thinking, had I not had the money sitting, there, sitting in the bank, someone else might have bid 60,000 you know, outbid me and got the shop and then that would have been not been great for me. Yeah, that's why I think it's always good having money in the bank. I have never read a novel in my life. I, I have read hundreds of business books. And the reason I've never read a novel is somebody has sat there and dreamt up some words in their head, written them down. I'm not going to waste a minute of my time reading that fiction. I would rather read business insights, lessons, facts, rather than some fiction. I'm old fashioned. I, I, I would buy a property because 
a property is a, an appreciating asset. It's never going to go down. Um, and I would, I would definitely put it into property or some stocks and shares, but only for the FTSE 100 companies. I would never invest in NFTs or crypto or any of these trendy schemes that are going on at the moment, whatever it is. You can't go wrong with property. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of just leaving money in the bank and people say, oh, you lose money, you lose money. It depreciates over a period of time. Back in 2009, 2010, I was saying the best thing is to have money in the bank and people were like, that's the dumbest thing to do because it's depreciating and they were all investing in Bitcoin. So after they've invested in Bitcoin, the, the price has gone up and then shot back down. They're left with nothing and I've still got money in the bank minus some inflation. So um, I think having money in the bank is a smart thing to do because it gives you options to do whatever you want. I was on the phone to ex-Papa John's guys and they were saying, we've closed down eight of our stores. Yeah, would you like to buy them? You're picking them up for pennies. You're picking them up very cheap. So we could just go and rebrand them, use a lot of the same equipment, the refrigeration, the air conditioning, the ventilation, all of that stuff's already in place. For us to transform that into a Boss Pizza is half the normal cost. Two of the main established brands, the reason they're failing is not because they're not making sales, is because their head offices are charged them too much royalty. Okay. That's the point of failure for those businesses. And one of them is charging up to 19% royalty fee. There's an HR fee, there's another fee, there's an admin fee, this fee, that fee, before you know it's 19%. You add in 20% VAT, 39%, you're never making any money. You're learning for that model, I well, guess, and ensuring that your franchise model set up yeah, differently. The, the, the way we're winning, we're putting the profit into the pocket of the franchisees. I'm, I'm not going to grow Boss Pizza. The franchisees are going to grow Boss Pizza. They're going to come back to me in six months and say, Ajmal, this is going really well. Can we get another store? Uh, my friend wants a store and my cousin wants a store. That's the way we're going to grow it. The hardest part of making passive income, it wasn't passive. It wasn't passive at all. And this is the big mistake a lot of people think. I had eight properties. The profit margins on them weren't great. So I was taking furniture up the stairs, down the stairs, uh, clearing out flats. When my university friends were out partying, I would say, oh no, I've got somewhere, I've got somewhere to be. That somewhere to be was in the bloody flats, cleaning them out because someone's left them in a mess. So my whole university life was spent cleaning flats, moving furniture about, um, just earning very little income. Uh, um, so there was nothing passive about that, that at all. So I think passive income is something that I've always been um, a bit skeptical about you don't get money for anything in any field. I'll tell you something right, paying your employees more is actually better for your business. The attrition rate is lower, the retention rate is higher and therefore your training cost is lower and the benefit of that is the consumer offering remains consistent. Imagine going into a business and you get served by someone who's really great, they leave and then the next minute it's someone else and the service is shoddy or it's rubbish. That's going to affect your brand in the, in the mind it of the consumer. makes such a big difference. Yeah. Way. Business is doing well. Don't spend money on stupid stuff. You don't need to buy the Rolexes and the fancy watches and the fancy cars. Save up the money, I put it away into property. Business made money, put it away into more property. The business made money, put it away into more property. I didn't buy any fancy watches or cars or anything like that. But for, for the first few years, I used to drive, you know, the little minis, I used to drive that. And then my wife said to me, like four years later, come on, you need to buy yourself a decent car. I was quite happy scooting around in a wee mini and I bought an S-Class. But that was only after my business is established and I had bought some property. So my strategy was let the business make money, invest into property. Business make money, invest into property. Are you a buy and hold guy? Buy and hold and never sell. In property, you make money in the, in the long run. And the years will pass by. I've bought property yesterday. All of a sudden, 10 years later, it's, it's, it's paid off. And now for the next 10 years, it's just going to be a cash cow. That's what we do with property, buy and hold. No one's talking about saving money. I think having money in the bank is the smartest thing to do. At the bottom of this street, you've got the Bentley garage, McLaren garage. Opposite my office, you've got the Maserati garage. And I own one acre of land here with 10 properties on the main commercial road in Lanarkshire. There was one shop I didn't own. When the gentleman came to selling it, I said, whatever the value is, I'll pay you double, but I want the date of entry to be as soon as possible. So I got the shop. That money now is insignificant because of the land marriage value of 10 properties, one acre of land. So in my opinion, having cash in the bank is the smartest thing to do because it gives you options. Let's talk about anti-Semitism. Last year or the year before, Scotland played Israel. So if I go along to Hampden Park and don't support Israel, does that make me anti-Semitic? 
<laughs> well, firstly, I'd like to say that throughout my entire life, I fought against racism and victimisation against every community. I, I would fight against any victimisation of any Jew that I saw in front yeah. of me. But I will be damned if I will be stopped from calling a genocidal nation what it is for the fear of being labelled as an anti-Semite. I think now if someone calls uh, someone else or even myself an anti-Semitic, I don't think it carries any weight because I am speaking out, exactly as you say, I am speaking out against a genocide. I'm not out there hating individually on Jews for practicing their religion or or their ethnic background. I am speaking out against a genocide. 1.5 million people displaced, 12,000 children killed. I'm speaking out against that and I am potentially being labeled anti-Semitic and I think that's just wrong. If somebody came to you just now and wanted to buy Boss Pizza, yep. what would you, what'd you buy, value it at and is it for sale? Uh, Boss Pizza is not for sale. Boss Pizza is my project for the next 10 years. Um, well, at least 7 to 10 years. I'm going to retire um, when I sell Boss Pizza 10 years. I'm going to be 60 at that point. Um, I'm not in Boss Pizza to make money. I'm in Boss Pizza to just see how far we can take this little business and to grow it. That's the business challenge for me. And I want the people that come on this journey with me to enjoy the fruits of that of, of that journey. Nobody is offended by a slice of pizza. <laughs> you take Indian food, you take a group of 10 people, there's going to be at least one person that says, oh, I don't fancy spicy food. You take Mexican food or Chinese food or any sushi food or any, any food in the world, any cuisine, there's always one person uh, that can put the handbrake on that night out and make the team go somewhere else. So no one is offended by a slice of pizza, one. And number two, it's a multi-billion pound market. So it made sense to go into that market. And third, the third reason is we're already in the Indian food space. We're dealing with dough, naan bread dough. So we're experts in dough management, so it's fairly easy to make the transition. You've got to cut out all of the negativity in your life. I've only got five or six people I talk to on a regular basis for my business. I don't have too many meetings. I don't have too many opinions. I keep my core team as small as possible and my interactions with that small team as large as possible and anyone else, my interactions with them are limited. Social media gives the impression that you start your business today, you're going to be successful tomorrow. You're lying on the beach the day after. It's not like that. Five years of hard, hard graft, then you can enjoy trappings of entrepreneurship. Had you asked me about success 15 years ago, I would have said success is big house, fancy holidays, nice cars. Ask me about success now, and I would say success is spending the maximum amount of time with your children, having the freedom not to work 40, 50 hours a week, being able to see your parents whenever you want, take time off whenever you want. That, for me now, is true success. The word success should be flexible throughout your career. In your 20s, it should mean something else. In your 30s, it should mean something else. In your 40s, it should mean something else, and so on. How much tax do you pay, sonny boy? Uh, I've paid a lot of tax. I've paid so much tax in my life. That is unbelievable. In fact, you might be asking that in a slightly sarcastic way, but you've just... Tony the Tiger. The biggest mistake I made in my career, in my business career in the early days was paying too much tax. And this is how you pay less tax. So I'm just going to use hundreds of pounds, just round figures. So if I made a hundred pounds profit, I would declare to the tax man, I've made a hundred pounds deposit. And then I would get charged corporation tax. I was 20% at the time. I would pay 20% corporation tax at the time. So I'm left with 80 pounds. So what I should have done is taken that 100 pounds and invested that back into my business um, and then paid 0% corporation tax. And no one told me that. I only realized that after five, six years of having paid thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of tax here, there and everywhere. Um, so um, tax efficiency um, is very good to have a healthy set of accounts. Um, but it's also, it can be smart to have accounts that show very little profit, 
but you're using that money to reinvest in your business and for a growing business that's very important destination rather than the journey and yeah. enjoying the journey and enjoying the growth um, yeah i'm really enjoying the journey we're bringing on some amazing franchisees and we're all excited about building a really fantastic business and that is my mission to build a fantastic business and i can look back and say you know what yeah i started that and yeah, I grew it to being a massive operation across the, all over the UK. Maybe there's, there's a niche instead of the business in Guru. You can be a maybe I, cause I, the, the thing I'm thinking of in my conversation right now is I want to be a franchisee. Because if I work with someone like you that's got all the experience in business, think about the lessons that I would learn from other businesses going forward as well. So yeah. maybe that's your, your niche. I'm not going to sell the business advice. You can be a franchisee with it and you can be part of the, the growth. I, I think that, that goes hand in hand. If anyone is a franchise partner with me, they become my partner and we're on this journey together. And the only way Boss Pizza is going to succeed is if those franchisees are succeeding. Yeah. And my mission is to make them as successful as possible. And if I do that, I tell you what, they're going to grow the business for me. Yeah. They're going to come back to me and say, Ajmal, my brother wants a franchise. My friend wants a franchise. So I'm going to use the franchise network to grow the business to being like a multi-hundred unit operation. And Domino's can be in the dust. Well... Let's see. That's well, brilliant to have you on. Yeah. Thanks for taking so I'm just checking in on a flat that I'm renovating at the moment. I'm just going to show you how much it costs. So come on, let's have a look. So this is a two bedroom flat. So on this, I'm going to spend £4,000 on the kitchen. I'm going to spend £4,000 in the bathroom. I'm going to spend about £2,000 in the flooring. And Jim, the young apprentice painter there. How much are you charging for painting this place? Three and a half, <laughs> This is apprentice, 18 year old Jim. He's just started painting. How's, how are you finding it? Very tiresome. You got a girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> Getting into property is great, but it costs 10, 15, 20,000 pounds up front before you even make any money. And then you recover that money very, very slowly. How many months do you need to rent this out to recover the money? Just going back to the office now, we'll get the numbers up in the board and we can see how little money we're going to make from this project. The monthly repayments on that flat are about 450. The rental income I'm going to get is 600 pounds. So that leaves a profit of 150 pounds per month. I'm going to spend £14,000 on that property. It's going to take me 7.7 .7 years to recover that money alone. Along the way, where you're winning property is the value of the property goes up over a period of time. So a warning, if you're thinking of getting into property for the short term gain, it's not as easy as everyone's making it out to be. What's dad taught you? Don't be a sellout. Don't be a sellout. Who was I recently approached by? OKX. OKX, they're the guys that do cryptocurrency that sponsor Man City. I just said no to them. You want to remain true to your audience. I talk about business. That's all I want to talk about. Don't let these companies put a little bit of money in your pocket and they can take what comes out your mouth. You don't want to do that. Authentic to your audience. You build up a more genuine, larger audience. And then further down the line, you'll get paid probably much more by a company that recognizes you for your skill as opposed to just some random company who needs some extra views. Questions about business. Ask me anything. Pop, that, pop your questions in the comment below. Matthew is going to read them and he's going to ask them and I'm going to answer them. Business, ask me anything. Matthew, next question, please. What do you think of the vending machine business? Is that a good thing to do when you're at a young age? A vending machine business is overrated. People think, oh, you get a vending machine and you put some crisps and chocolates in it, you get, you're going to make a lot of money. Absolutely not. Um, you have to pay the ground rent. Um, you have to pay um, the cost of the machine. And then the profit margin on the actual goods going into the machine, um, you're maybe talking 35-40% on a bar of chocolate. Um, and if you add in how many bars of chocolate you sell in that machine a week, how long it takes you to actually go to that machine, top it up, maintain it, um, yeah, keep the machine clean, etc. I don't think it's going to be that looked that I don't think it's going to be worthwhile unless you've got hundreds of them dotted around where you can then benefit from, benefit from the economies of scale. I've actually seen in America, some people saying, oh, they do the vending machine, have a vending machine business, stick a vending machine there. Yeah, you can't just go and put a vending machine anywhere. The, whoever owns the land is going to want some rent from you. And the cost of a vending machine is quite expensive as well. So how many bars of chocolate at 35 pence profit do you need to sell in order to make back the 2,000, 3,000 pounds of original investment? Some of the greatest videos that I've put out, nah, that, that, that's not going to do well. And bang, it's got millions of views. And then the flip side, the videos that we think, oh, that's a great video. We spent a lot of effort on that. They flop.
don't be the judge. See the stuff in the early years that I thought resonates with the, the, the audience, I was totally wrong. People want to see the real nuts and bolts of business. So you might think it's dry, I'm telling you, that is no drier than a, a, a pizza being put in an oven traveling along a conveyor belt and coming out the other end. There'll be companies out there that are looking to buy your product. And if you're talking about the engineering process, you know, how, how great your packaging is, how great your service is, just start talking about your business and don't you be the judge, let your audience be the judge. I said to the guy, I want the date of entry to be tomorrow. And he said, okay. So I phoned my solicitor up, Carties of Hamilton, Jim Toner. He'll verify this. I said, Jim, the date of entry is tomorrow. He goes, it can't be done. I said, Jim, it's a bit of paperwork. Just can do that. <laughs> right. goes, I, think, uh, I think we've all had that conversation yeah. with oh, solicitors. Oh, okay. He uh, goes, okay, let me see what I can do. Uh, it was a cash purchase, no call report, no nothing. So they, they managed to do it. And he did it. Of course they managed uh, to do it. They just try and drag it out for seven or eight weeks to justify their fee, don't they? I know. I think about and I'm, I'm in London. I, I'd been working in London where you're doing like 30 page proposals back and forth on a daily basis. What a solicitor does, right? I'm not bad mouthing solicitors, right? It's, it's like, oh, here's a here's a property. Yeah, the, the, it's got a roof and some walls and here's the deeds for it. I'm selling it to you here. Can you check that? Is it okay? And you say, yeah, it's okay. Right, we're happy to exchange. That's roughly what lawyers do, right? And why does it need to take eight, nine weeks, six, seven weeks? So I said to Jim, just do it, and he did it. Every single wall in my office is white, and the reason it's white is very simple. A few years ago, I appeared in a newspaper, and I was delighted with that, so I put it up in the wall. Then a few weeks later, I appeared um, in another magazine. Yep, put it up in the wall. And then it got to the point, our marketing was that slick. Every wall, in every room, every cupboard, every storage space, crates upon crates upon crates of publicity. And this was all generated in-house. We didn't have any agency working for us. TV channels as well. One day I walked into the office and I thought, you know what, I'm sick of looking at myself. And I just ordered everything to be taken down and the walls to be painted white. So that's why the walls are white. Is that the reason behind the, see the social media stuff and the TikTok stuff? Yeah. Is that kind of the reason that, like, it's quite good just following your journey as well? Is yeah. that why you're doing that? Is it kind of... The, to show the progress. The, the TikTok I'm doing because I love talking about business. And I think the reason I'm doing TikTok is there are too many gurus out there giving rubbish advice and charging a lot of money. And if I can move into that space and give experiences from my own business journey free of charge, someone might say, you know what? Yeah, that's a good point. That's just saved me two thousand pounds in this bullshit and course. Do you get messages from people and all, all that? All the time. What, what's if you had any good TikTok hate? Because there's some hate out there as well. There's some real kind of nut jobs. Out. Where you win in property is if you play the long game. If you play the short game, there is a higher risk that you end up with not very much because you know by the time you pay your legal fees, your stamp duties, you know all of the, all of the the hundreds of overheads, it's not that lucrative at all. So where you win in property is if you play the long game. In my early twenties, I saw my dad and my uncle have a discussion they bought a cottage for 53,000 pounds right it's 53,000 but they paid 56,000 because they really wanted it and the lady was quite determined that she wanted more so they paid 56,000 pounds for it 3,000 pounds over and I remember my dad and my uncle thinking gosh we've paid too much for that we've paid 3,000 pound over right fast forward 20 years that that 3,000 pound is insignificant mm -hmm. so what I've learned from that is if I really want a property I don't mind paying an extra five, 10, 20, 30,000 pounds for it, even 100,000 pounds for it. I don't mind because if you take the long term view, that 100,000 pounds or 50,000 pounds is insignificant. If somebody came to you just now and wanted to buy Boss Pizza, yep. what would you, what'd you buy, value it at and is it for sale? Uh, Boss Pizza is not for sale. Boss Pizza is my project for the next 10 years, um, or at least seven to 10 years. I'm going to retire. Um, when I sell Boss Pizza 10 years. I'm going to be 60 at that point. Um, I'm not in Boss Pizza to make money. I'm in Boss Pizza to just see how far we can take this little business and to grow it. That's the business challenge for me. And I want the people that come on this journey with me to enjoy the fruits of that of, of that journey. And 